Hello, Jonathan and Jillian. So we're now up to Bill Clinton, uh, his administration as president. Uh, his actual name is William Jefferson Clinton. Though aside from his inauguration, I don't think anybody I ever heard anybody refer to him that way during his whole time in office. It was always Bill. But uh, you'll remember that Bill Clinton uh, was the governor of Arkansas. He was a generational shift. Um, George H.W. Bush was the Republican nominee in 1992 was a World War II war hero. He was a naval aviator in World War II, won the Distinguished Flying Cross, I believe, and several other awards, shot down by the Japanese, rescued from the ocean by an American submarine, a classic World War II genuine hero. But by 1992, the World War II generation is quite senior. Right, we're now talking, uh, uh, Bush was well in his 70s at this point. Bill Clinton, on the other hand, was a baby boomer. He was born after World War II. He's a generation younger than George Bush. Very much a representative of the baby boomer generation. He came of age in the late 1960s and early 1970s, got a deferment for uh, being in college, from serving in the military by draft. Never went to Vietnam, never served in the military. Um, he was a uh, very bright, very capable student, got his bachelor's degree at Georgetown, went on as a Rhodes Scholar, uh, which is a very prestigious international scholarship to study at Oxford University, then came back to study law at Yale. Uh, that's where he met the woman he married, uh, Hillary Rodham, became Hillary Rodham Clinton, uh, Hillary Clinton, uh, his wife. Uh, when he was still an extremely young man, late 20s, in his late 20s, he ran for Congress in Arkansas, his home state. He didn't win, but two years later, at 30 years of age, he was elected the uh, Attorney General of Arkansas at 30. Two years after that, he was elected the Governor of Arkansas at 32. So he's a whiz kid, right? Uh, served eight of the next 10 years as the governor of Arkansas. I did lose once, but he served four terms as the governor of Arkansas. And at 42, he started running for president. So we go from a man in his 70s, pitted against a man in his 40s um, as president, <clears throat> running for president. Now, Bill Clinton was part of a group called the Democratic Leadership Council. And he thought the reason the Democrats had lost 12 years in a row to the Republicans for the presidency, and remember, only Jimmy Carter had won since 1968, a long swath of time, the Democrats had not been able to win the White House. And he thought it was that, frankly, the Democrats on economic issues were too liberal, too tax and spend oriented. He thought that the American people was accepting of a lot of Democrat principles on social values as being fairly liberal, but not on economic values. That Americans did not want to be taxed, and they didn't want the government to spend so much, that the Americans wanted a more deficit conscious uh, president. So the Democratic Leadership Council were much more moderate, even borderline conservative on economic issues and fairly liberal on social issues. And that's the kind of platform Bill Clinton ran on. And he won. He defeated George Bush. Remember I told you that part of the reason was Bush had raised taxes when he had pledged to read my lips, no new taxes. But also the economy wasn't doing great when the election took place. It was in recession, although a mild recession. And by the time Clinton took office in January, the recession was clearly coming to an end. But Clinton, you know, takes steps. He uh, got the Democratic con control of Congress to pass a tax cut for most Americans, middle class and working class Americans, but a small tax increase on the richest Americans. And uh, also modestly cut the budget 
about $60 billion of memory serves. So again, trying to show these Democratic Leadership Council values of more financial responsibility, a modest tax cut to most Americans, a modest tax increase for the rich, uh, modest budget cuts to the federal budget, partly because of the cold, end of the Cold War, it was still believed we could cut the military some. So the budget deficit began to go down under Clinton. In fact, I believe the deficit went down every year of the eight years he was president. And finally, in the last couple of years, we had a budget surplus. The overall deficit, uh, you know, the national debt in the United States actually went down in the last Clinton years. For the first time in ages, we began to pay off some of the national debt with budget surpluses. So, you know, that is one thing one can credit to Bill Clinton. Now, part of the reason for that wasn't the president's policies necessarily at all. It was high tech industry in the United States took off like a rocket. And that, of course, was stimulated by the Internet. Uh, the Internet to my recollection, was developed as a concept in the late 70s and early 80s. I think when I was a college kid in the mid-80s, I heard about the Internet, but it wasn't something that most people could use. The World Wide Web, as something your average American could use, went online in 1993-94. You had AOL and Yahoo, things like that, came around in the early 90s, um, by the time I was practicing law in 1993, 94, I heard about it. I believe I got my first dial-up modem and went online uh, at my home in late 94, very early 95. And that that's about when your average middle-class American got the internet. Now, compared to what you guys are used to with lightning fast speeds and streaming movies, and that, of course, is years still in the future. But we could use the telephone line to dial up. You've probably in old movies, you know, seen bah, 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 on the telephone. That's how we were getting online still for years. It would be the early 2000s before we really moved away from that to more direct ways to get on the Internet. But uh, it was a miracle. And uh, people began to exploit it economically. Internet companies were born. Yahoo, AOL. Uh, Microsoft uh, started writing software for internet related things on like Microsoft Explorer, a web browser. And uh, so this, this led to a boom, Silicon Valley, which in case you didn't know, is the area around Palo Alto, California, near San Francisco. Palo Alto Valley, uh, near San Francisco. It's where Stanford University is and where enormous um, uh, Cupertino, California is in that area, uh, Apple, and so on, um, uh, in Silicon Valley. That, that created an economic boom in America, which paid off in higher incomes, higher taxes coming in, uh, and that combined with a responsible budget, budgeting brought down the national debt in Clinton's time. Okay, so... Among the things that you can credit the Clinton administration doing, which again did help the economy broadly, although today Mr. Trump is heavily critical of it, uh, so critical it was replaced under Mr. Trump's leadership, but at the time it was much praised in 1993 when NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Agreement, NAFTA, N-A-F-T-A, NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Agreement went into a play, into place. This was a tariff-free zone for Mexico, the United States, and Canada. So if something was made in Mexico or in Canada, it could be sold in the United States as if it had been made in the United States. If something was made in the United States, it could be sold in Canada and Mexico as if it had been made in those countries with zero tariff barriers to block those things. And it did stimulate economic growth. This is another reason the American economy grew so nicely for 10 straight years throughout the 90s and into the early 2000s, was NAFTA. Now, over time, that has been criticized by many people. President Trump especially criticizes it because 
workers in Mexico will work cheaper than Americans can work. You're not going to feed your family if you work in a factory and earn $10 an hour. You're just not going to be able to do it on a 40-hour week. So Americans have to be paid more than that to work and, the, and the, you know, better than minimum wage in almost any factory job. But in Mexico, people can feed their families on much less. So American companies began opening up factories in Mexico to make things that were sold in the United States. No tariff barrier, right? If I make it in a factory on the Mexican side of the border, put it on a truck, send it into Texas, sell it in Texas, no tariffs. But I can pay those Mexican workers much less than I could pay workers in Texas, right? This led to an export of jobs to Mexico from manufacturing in the United States. People closed down plants. I recall not all that long ago, Harley Davidson closed one of its two American plants down and moved the, moved the manufacturing to Mexico because NAFTA made that make sense. So NAFTA was probably good on the whole for the American economy, but it did cause an exporting of jobs from the U.S. to Mexico and has been criticized for that. And uh, the U.S.-Mexico-Canada-USMC agreement is what Mr. Trump calls this agreement was just ratified, has gone into effect, it is a revision of NAFTA that is meant to boost American manufacturing to discourage somewhat this attempt to move American jobs to Mexico. We'll see if it works. We'll see if it works. But anyway, NAFTA was considered a great achievement of Bill Clinton's in his first administration. Um, well, that's 12 minutes. I think that's good enough for this lecture. Tomorrow, we'll continue with another lecture on the Clinton administration, talk about what happened domestically, uh, some, some achievements and some real challenges. Domestic terrorism, not Muslims, Americans attacking Americans, attacking the American government would become a major issue in the Clinton administration. Take care. Bye.